Hello and welcome to the One World Media Awards live stream event. Thank you for joining us. I'm John Snow and I'm really delighted to be joined by Maria Ressa, founder, chief executive of the independent news site Rappler who were the recipients of this year's One World Media Special Award, an award which seeks to recognize and encourage outstanding reporting that informs the public, provides an outlet for people's voices, and holds those in power to account. Congratulations, Maria. Welcome to One World Media Awards 2020. Before we get started, I would like to, just to take a quick moment to highlight why we were all gathered here. For over 30 years, the One World Media Awards have brought together the international media community to shine a light on underreported under stories that break down stereotypes, change the narrative, and connect people from different cultures. Something I think we can all agree is more important now than ever before. And something Maria and her team at Rappler continue to do despite immense pressure and the threat of restrictions, imprisonment, and violence. If you'd like to find out more about this year's awards, nominees, winners, and the other live stream events available to watch, you can click the links in the description below. Now, Rappler has become one of the largest and most important media platforms in the Philippines. Uncovering President Duterte's extensive fake news campaign and reporting really fearlessly on the extrajudicial killings that have been carried out by security forces as part of Duterte's brutal war on drugs. Rappler's Defend Press Freedom campaign has highlighted the rising threat against journalists, not just in the Philippines, but all over the world. And that's you know, why we're proud to be One World Media, because this campaign to highlight the immense difficulties particularly in the developing world, of journalists managing to do the job that absolutely has to be done for humanity, for all of us to prosper and have our full human rights in the countries in which we live. Welcome, Maria Ressa. And for me, it's a very great honor to talk to you because, you know, we have it easy here. We may, we may think we're suffering from the pandemic and all the rest of it, and indeed we are, but we don't have the really tremendous odds against which you are able to perform your, your duty and, and your great expertise. So I'd love to ask you on behalf of everybody who's watching some questions. And I want to ask you about Rappler itself. Um, how did the idea for Rappler come about? And if you were to uh, link me to it, what would I find? Uh, so I, I think coming from traditional journalism around 2010, I think we began to realize that something was changing and that technology was changing everything, right? Um, and so we created Rappler in 2012 really as an experiment. We wanted to try to figure out you know, what, what is really happening because I was handling the largest news group in the Philippines, multimedia. And, um, and I realized that we were so focused on efficiency and not enough on the internet, which was where we had placed our younger folks instead of our experienced folks to figure it out. So Rappler was that experiment. When I left ABS-CBN, several, four or five of us above 40 at that point in time, and then the rest were 20 somethings, the smartest 20 somethings we could find. And we started with only 12 people. So from managing a thousand people to 12 people, that was culture shock. And then the elevator pitch that I had was one sentence, Rappler builds communities of action. And the whole idea there really is, and it's still deep in my belief of what the future of journalism is going to look like. We are intertwined with technology. And unfortunately for journalists and news organizations, our old power was, you know, we created both content and we had the distribution. Well, tech came along and took out the power of distribution from us. And so that's gatekeeping right? The old gatekeeping. When we wrote something, we were liable for what we wrote. And we were guardians of fact. When tech came in, tech was actually um, 
tech abdicated its responsibility. And in fact, growth was predicated on, uh, on anger spreading fastest, more emotional time period, and lies laced with anger and hate spread fastest on social media. So all of a sudden, news groups were, were left without distribution, and the new gatekeepers weren't exercising the power of gatekeeping. Rappler went into this. We drank the Kool-Aid of Facebook. Face, we were essentially alpha partners of Facebook, and we grew exponentially at the beginning. Um, we built communities of action, but then we were also on the front lines of the attacks against, uh, against journalists, against truth tellers. Uh, journalists were first attacked in the Philippines. In 2016, when we did the Propaganda War series, uh, we, I wrote two of the three pieces, and the second piece questioned how Facebook algorithms impact democracy. We know that that impact has happened globally. And for the record, right, the President Duterte was elected in May 2016, followed a month later by Brexit, and then all the dominoes just fell that year down to the election of President Trump. Not saying that those are the dominoes, but these is where we saw significant disinformation networks playing and coalescing. So I, I ran away from where the, the, what is the, Rappler is about building communities of action. After all of the attacks in 2016, 2017, 2018, we realized that the way to fight back is to control the tech. So you'll see this year on World Press Freedom Day, we actually rolled out something that we had been thinking about and hatching and planning tech in the hands of journalists, which means, you know, um, how can we build communities of action and keep our users safe? move them away from thinking fast to thinking slow so that we can go back to the integrity of facts. I think that's, that's what we're trying to do now. So we rolled out a beta version of this, this new platform and we are next week uh, going to roll it out site-wide. So we've been getting the bugs out. I think that's, that's what we're trying to do is in the end, journalism switched from being something that you step back and, kind of tell everybody what everyone is doing to social media changed all of that. Mm. Uh, and as we're seeing in the United States, the debate that they're having about should journalists have a moral compass? <laughs> and then our, uh, in our case here in the Philippines, we had that uh, mm. in 2016. And then when I was arrested it, last year, I felt like I was unshackled because I didn't have to ask anyone else whether they were guilty or not. And I didn't have to research it. I knew I wasn't guilty and my rights were abused. So uh, there you go. Sorry. I just went. Um, but I'm intrigued because I'm, I'm intrigued because um, in many ways, the issue with the social media is that you, you, you tend to shoot first very quick. And you're saying, no, we, we, we do things rather more considered than that. And, and we take our time. We don't just burst into, in, into being with whatever we want to talk about. We, we sort of sort it out first and then we publish, which isn't really how most people operate online. Yeah. So I think it's not that we don't. It's that you atomize it, right? Mm. So I think what tech has done is it's atomized meaning. And what it's done is this atomized meaning. People forget to pull it back up together to tell you what it means. And that's what I hope journalists will do. Mm. I don't think we can live in a thinking fast world and protect the integrity of facts. And if you don't have integrity of facts, you're not going to have the integrity of marketplaces. And you certainly can't have integrity of elections. But and I'm that's moving, what's at that, stake. By moving online as fast as you did and, and, and capturing the social network, were you in a way running ahead of the authorities? Were, were, were they having to play catch up uh, in a very, very sensitive time in the Philippines uh, in, in order to sort of um, combat whatever you were doing? So I think it's two implicit assumptions in that question is that uh, when we first started doing this on Facebook, this was the period of time when it was the uh, enabler of, of voices, right? So uh, we grew as fast as the top television network in our first few years. Um, but it wasn't until the Duterte campaign that a politician actually took social media and used it to win the top post. And that happened from 2015 to 2016. And in that instance, 
just like in Egypt or in other parts of the world, once power comes into the same space and there are no safeguards, uh, users uh, weren't protected from this, they came on with exponential, with large resources and disinformation networks. Uh, they were able to exploit the weaknesses of the design of the platforms and to use the kind of advertising driven uh, model that social media had. So essentially, this is now a behavioral modification system. And you, as the user, put in all your data. You, it keeps track of it. And using machine, machine learning and artificial intelligence, it knows you more intimately than you know yourself, than your most intimate relationship, and serves up your most vulnerable moment to the advertiser, whether it's a company or a government, that wants to sway what you believe and how you behave in the real world. That's dangerous. And that's one of the reasons that we need to actually actively look at the role of social media in, in killing democracies. Well, the real world has come to visit you in very real forms. I mean, you've had death threats, you've been arrested, you've been taken to court. How, I mean, what makes you keep going and how actually have you survived? And, and what can we do to help you survive, to support you? You know, there's a great book by Tim Snyder, a Yale historian, who uh, it's, it's called On Tyranny. And mm -hmm. he said that one of the first things he said is don't voluntarily give up your rights. I'm, I'm paraphrasing that. And this campaign, thank you to One World Media, the campaign that we ran is hashtag defend press freedom. That's evolved now to hashtag hold the line hold the line of our rights, hashtag courage on, turn on your courage, because it does take courage. How do we survive? Um, ironically, the kindness of strangers. Uh, we built a community that, that believes in certain values, that believes in accountability journalism, that believes that the mission of journalism is more important today. We continue to do hard hitting investigative reporting uh, to hold government to account, we want to stop the impunity. It started that way, the impunity in this brutal drug war, and to stop the impunity of Facebook as well, the manipulation of people at mass scale. Um, what we did along the way when we came under attack was to keep evolving. Uh, when the government filed in, in 2016, we had exponential attacks online. In 2017, President Duterte in his State of the Nation address echoed those same attacks, and he said we were foreign owned, which isn't true. And I tweeted that immediately. But a week later, we got our first subpoena. And within a few months, we on January 2018, January 15th or something like that, 2018, we got our first um, a shutdown notice trying to revoke our license to operate. We just decided to fight back and to keep operating. But in 2018, in about 14 months, we had 11 cases and investigations. We kept fighting back lots of legal fees. Uh, because we were under attack, our advertisers dropped out. Uh, almost 50% dropped out before mid-year by April 2018. But we were forced to find a B2B model, and that is now the saving grace of Rappler. That B2B model using data and technology that journalists discovered, handed it over, productized it, that has grown 12,000%. Mm -hmm. So we're okay in that sense, right? So the business of journalism is okay, which is, but the next part is how do we survive? And our community has come to help us. Our legal fees at one point were millions of pesos, $40,000 a month. And we've created a membership model. And the people who came into that membership model were there because of our, the values and are helping us as we chart. Now, the Philippines has moved into a whole other area. I think we're at the precipice where enough of our rights have been destroyed in acting. Impunity in the drug war is one. But now there is a bill that will uh, institutionalize certain facts that are unconstitutional, that will tear apart the Constitution. This is the anti-terror bill that just needs President Duterte's signature. So that's the evolution that we've had. And I guess what we're doing is, until the Philippines changes its form of government, we continue to hold the line. Of you course, know there are costs. Maria, to, the, to those of us who do not live in the Philippines and, and have only, if ever we've been, it's only been once or twice. And 
I, I mean, one thinks of what you're up against as being pretty totalitarian when it comes down to it. And if they want to stop you, they can. And I'm, I'm wondering how it is you survived in 2018 and you've survived 2020 and you've been going effectively for four or five years now, which is absolutely remarkable uh, in such a time. How, how have you evaded shutdown? I know you say you've paid a lot of lawyers' fees. Is there therefore something in the constitution that has defended you? Absolutely, the Bill of Rights, mm -hmm. freedom of the press, freedom of expression. Right? We, so I guess, how did we survive it? We didn't voluntarily give up our rights. Mm. We didn't shut down when we were given a shutdown order. We, we continued fighting it. We continued doing hard hitting reporter. We built a community, and of course, there are costs, right? Uh, in 2019, I had to post bail eight times. I was arrested. Uh, I had arrests with an S, right? And I was detained. And I haven't done anything differently that I've done as a journalist. And this is coming up on my 35th year. But the cost of doing this meant that in 2019, I spent a lot of time in courtrooms. I was one week, I could be in four different courtrooms because all those eight charges were, um, were being litigated at that point in time. Now, on, uh, it, actually on Monday, the first verdict will, will be handed down. And this is a cyber libel case that uh, the, the story that we supposedly, <laughs> the story was published seven years before the case was filed. And it was four months before the law we allegedly violated had even been enacted. So I, it's clear to me at least uh, that these politically motivated charges uh, were meant to stop us, were meant to intimidate us, and we just refused to stop. The lesson I've learned in these last few years is when there's a Damocles sword hanging over your head, if you let fear um, guide your actions, then that Damocles sword accomplishes its mission. But if you continue doing your job and continue demanding the rights that are guaranteed in the Constitution, then the weaponization of the law must be codified, right? Every person who signed my arrest warrants, in eight, my eight arrest warrants, every person, I will remember who they are. They are written in our history. Now the verdicts will come in. And I just hope that, you know, I, I still have some faith and hope that the individual judges will be guided by the spirit of the law and not the politics of the times. And if they're not, what are the consequences? It's huge, uh, a penalty of seven years in prison. Uh, and that could be one of the things there. But I guess this is one of those things. I've been thinking a lot about this. It's been four years of attacks. I was already, I was in my, I was in my 50s when the attacks began. And, and like you, I had been a journalist for a long time. So I wasn't going to change who I am. My, I don't have situational ethics. So we just, the path was very clear to me. And I suppose this is the, this is where that path leads. I, I'm prepared for the worst, but I hope for the best. There are going to be many journalists watching this and they're going to be saying- That's our only defense, you know. And you know ma ma many of us think we do a reasonable job, but none of us, none of us experience what is happening to you. I, I mean, I want to go back to a specific thing, the Defend Press Freedom campaign that you ran. I mean, what inspired you to set that up and how effective was it? it the context is real. You know, it was our reaction to the death by a thousand cuts of not just press freedom, but Philippine democracy. And so by doing that, that hashtag, Defend Press Freedom, we were able to make it clear that this is, it's not just about journalists. Sometimes people think that, you know, it's about, it isn't. The, funda the foundation of every single right in the Constitution is, is the right to know, is the right that, uh, that journalists are acting for, for the public. Um, if we give this up, there's a phrase in one of the, in the top newspaper here, they said, you know, they came for the journalists and then no one knows what happened. 
So in that sense, the Fen Press Freedom became a rallying cry to unite all the journalists. And there were still many who wanted to kind of sit on the side and not be targeted because there are consequences to demanding your rights. Um, but then we, we simplified it to hashtag hold the line. Hold the line. Don't voluntarily give up your rights. And now that, that call, we've amplified it with hashtag courage on because you're going to need courage to deal with where our country is and i think the philippines is at the precipice the government is using a veneer of legality to attack journalists and perceived critics um we can't buckle and i i guess and that's why we continue because our community has come around it how did it how did it end uh we have communities paying helping us pay for legal fees joining membership so that's very concrete but more than that are the kinds of the awareness of filipinos that this is a time for action and you don't have to be running out in the streets although we can't even if we wanted to right now right because of the the shutdown um but in our rights and this is our call for filipinos in your area of influence how can you make this uh, the kind of world you want to live in, where democracy thrives. You talk about empowering communities, and then you talk about communities empowering you. I mean, different communities, uh, sometimes communities that have money, I mean, lawyers yes. and the rest of it. But I just wondered if you could talk about these communities you have empowered. I mean, the Philippines is quite a, a, a difficult landmass with all those islands and all the rest of it. I mean, and you're not the biggest organization in the Philippines. Um, so I, I just wonder, give me an example of how you have empowered a community and what they were able to do that they couldn't do before. Sure. So the very first community that we did was climate change, where right? putting together 38 NGOs, uh, government agencies, and giving, amplifying their voice and putting them all together. Because sometimes these communities work across purposes. The Philippines at that point was the third most disaster prone countries. We, we, we have an average of 20 typhoons every year. And from 2012 to 2016, we literally rebuilt a platform where we used social media to use hashtags, alerts, if you need information, if you need help. And we worked with the Office of Civil Defense, the government. They used this very public map that was built and they could respond immediately if someone called for help. Sometimes the Red Cross would respond if someone needed help. That was incredible. That was a whole, that, that gave us tremendous energy. So in some After form, the, in some form, you were all now working with the very government that really effectively would like to have got rid of you. It was the administration before uh -huh. the Duterte administration. Uh -huh. Before the Duterte. Um, okay. That was in 2012. I think this right. administration had had to grapple with um, how much of old processes did they make keep? How how much do they value loyalty? And then how will they how will they craft the way forward? Um, in many ways, you know, the administration of President Duterte came out of Davao City in Mindanao Island and. In many instances, it's almost a complete break from, from the old power that was there. And that's part of what we're the struggles right now and when you're dealing with a pandemic, because you need a whole of society approach. And the Duterte administration, while it used social media well, mm. also used it to divide society. Mm. And, and that is a difficult thing when you need everybody to be working together. What, what is really interesting is that it, what, what you are bringing to the table is, is in many ways, a, a, a very new and, and exciting concept of journalism. Because I think we old guys, we, we used to think journalism was simply about reporting the facts. That, that'll do. Uh, what you have, and I, I mean, I think quite a lot of us are now beginning to, because of the social network, are beginning to be more activist than we ever dared be in the past. But, right. but you're really bringing something quite revolutionary, really. You're you're bringing a sort of, uh, not only shining a light, but affecting what you're shining a light on and empowering the people uh, that you are highlighting in your reporting. 
so the way I, I talk about this and think about it is that these communities of action, what we feed them is our journalism. Yep. Because no community can act without the right information, right? And especially now when what spreads on social media are lies, are the disinformation. They actually are taking the center of the Philippine information ecosystem. Um, I, I think this is still a battle that Western news organizations are going through. But, you know, I spent almost 20 years with CNN and I was in areas in Southeast Asia where I... I would be uh, uh, an easy one, East Timor or Kashmir or areas where you're the first person on the scene and then you have water, but no one else does, right? So I learned from that, like what we would do always is bring another box of water that we would give to people who, who need it. And then when I headed the largest news group in the Philippines, ABS-CBN, which has just been shut down by the government on May 5th, um, when I headed that, we had a helicopter that would always get to the to wherever the disaster has happened. But there are six seats on the chopper. And what we did is three of those seats would be for journalists, but the other three would be for our foundation and they would be bringing relief goods. That was something we did during my time because that's a reality. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to be a reporter demanding uh, the story when the person you are talking to doesn't have water. That, that's a very basic thing. And then, of course, I saw Western news groups starting to do that in Hurricane Katrina, right? Mm -hmm. And then now what we're seeing in the United States, um, I think the question is whether or not this idea of objectivity really exists. And even when I was with CNN, I always felt that it, uh, let me put it in, in my eyes, even when I was with CNN, I replaced a guy who was a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant male here in the Philippines. I know, He's I know. six foot two, right? I, I'm five foot two, I'm Filipino American, and that infuses my reporting. And I think that's the kind of reporting that I'm, I headed to, more transparency, be transparent. And then, and then look, at, look at the realities of how we deal with with our communities. That was kind of why I decided to come home, why I decided to head the largest network. And then when technology took it a step further, when I saw that legacy news agencies, really what made them successful were not what's going to allow them to innovate for the future. That's why we started Rappler. Now, fake news in the Philippines is on a scale that even we cannot imagine. And that seems also to be one of your huge efforts is to expose it whenever you find it. Um, just, just describe how fake news is working because most of us, I think really joke about fake news because it, it, it doesn't really have that much effect. I think in the West, there's a lot of misinformation that flows from it, but, but you can combat it. Uh, but, but where the government and where authority is involved in peddling it. I mean, that's something, that's something big. So how, so, how do you tackle that? So let me take, take it first on a global and then bring it to the Philippines, right? We know from the Mueller report that the 2016 elections in the United States was influenced by Russian disinformation. I always wonder why Western news groups say misinformation instead of disinformation. And one of the fracture lines of society they hit was Black Lives Matter. They played both sides of Black Lives Matter. That was in 2012. Fast forward to 2020, when this kind of information operations was relatively left unchecked. And you can see that online hate uh, translates to real world uh, fissures that, that break open, right? Here in the Philippines, what happened was, um, we were all, news groups were essentially all in the middle because there wasn't really a right or left. We didn't really have that. But what happened after President Duterte took office was a, a, a systematic way of supporting President Duterte that really like took lies that were laced with anger and hate. And it was the fracture line of society they were targeting was the gap between the rich and the poor. And what they did is they created enemies and they so they attacked enemies i was one of them rapper was one of them and they tried to in the case of the narrative they would change journalist with criminal and 
pound that exponentially, pound me in silence, take out, take my voice out of it, which didn't happen because I didn't allow it. But, and then the next step is to spread astroturf, a bandwagon effect. So more people, real people believe that Maria Ressa is criminal, <laughs> not a journalist, right? That's, that's one route. The disinformation networks would then do this. This polarization in society happened because the pro-Duterte network would move further away because the filter bubbles of the way social media is designed built, was built that way. And they then would not hear the other side, while the other side, the anti-Duterte, would move further away. And here's this chasm in society today where facts are now debatable. That's what we've been fighting. And part of the reason we can do this is because we, we have the information ecosystem, a database of how information flows through it. And then the second thing is we use natural language processing to take out narratives. What are the narratives that are flowing through the disinformation networks? Rappers, one of the fact-checking partners of Facebook. We're one of two Filipino fact-checking partners. When we see that it, when we rate something false, we then look at the network that spreads that lie. And then we kind of can see, I, I treat them like they're terrorist networks. And that's what we can see in our database. And what's happened over time is that the center of the information ecosystem on Facebook, which is essentially our internet, has been taken over by disinformation networks. And news groups who don't work together have been pushed to the periphery. And that's what we have to fight. Mm. I'm sorry, did I answer your question or was you I did, too You deep? did, and, and it chimes with, with our own experience. I mean, there's no question, um, and you mentioned it a bit earlier, but the, the rise of populist leaders is being facilitated very much by the social network and, and, and by fake news. Um, absolutely. And, and, and it, it, I mean, to be absolutely honest, if our forefathers ran into Donald Trump, they, they would wonder whether they, we were still on the same earth that they had left us, really. And, and, that, and Donald Trump is not alone. You can see them in many other places. Um, and, and, but I, th I feel that you and Rappler are much more exposed than we are. Uh, not, not to the fake news so much as to the ruthlessness of the authorities. That's so what I think the difference... You. You know, the Cambridge Analytica whistleblower, Chris Wiley, said yeah. that the Philippines was the Petri dish. He called us the Petri dish and that they experimented with tactics of mass manipulation in our country. And that kind of makes sense. 110 million people. We speak English. Uh, we spend the most time on, on the Internet and on social media globally. That's um, we are social and Hootsuite has that stat. And this is like the fifth year, I think, running that that's that's the case. And um, when you take that, uh, if it succeeds in the Philippines, they take that tactic and port it over to the West. Port was his word. Um, look, what happened here is actually what's happening in many other democracies around the world. The attacks are bottom up first. And then when the leader says it, you're sandwiched. It's like you're in a pressure cooker if you're the news group fake news. When President Trump called CNN and the New York Times fake news, President Duterte called us fake news a week later, right? So it travels. Um, but I think one of the reasons that we're pushing back is, look, in the United States, no matter how you look at it, their institutions are still strong enough. They were strong enough. And in the Philippines, we had our institutions were weak to begin with. And literally have almost collapsed in the first six months of the Duterte administration. He's very powerful. But as long as he wants to have a veneer of rule of law, Rappler will continue doing the stories. I, I, I would prefer, frankly, if he says, look, we're a dictatorship tomorrow. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. And here are the rules. And this is what you have to do. Then at least we don't, there's no hypocrisy. But as long as the, this country is a democracy under a constitution that is patterned after the United States, that has a Bill of Rights like the United States, then we will continue doing our task. And that makes the mission of journalism even more important. Let's pause for a moment and just to explore Rappler itself. First of all, how did you get the name? Uh, we did something that as a traditional journalist, I was really afraid of. We made it up, you know, and it was really... <laughs> 
we were divided because I, you know, one group who, who said we should make it up, and and they were they were you can see how ambitious we were. They were like, look, Google made it up. Google. And I was like, okay, guys, we're not Google number one, but you know, we're supposed to be journalists. So how do you make up a name for yourself? But it I is a great to... name. It's a great name. I mean, I, I can kind of visualize Rappler. It's got a kind of, you know. <laughs> I'm so glad. So it comes from like rappelling, right? Yeah. Climbing up to yeah. the top. Rappler. Rap. Actually, this is where it came from. The founders were like, uh, we still remember the time when rap meant the talk. Mm. And then plus ripple, because we wanted conversation. We wanted the atomized conversations on social media to ripple through society. And I think that was our goal, right? Because social media atomizes meaning. How do you restore meaning? And that's what Rappler, what Rappler was. But thank you for asking. Yes, we made it up and we were debating whether journalists should be making up a name, but yes, we did. How many of you are there and how do you manage to fund it? So today, so we started with 12 people. Within mm -hmm. about a year and a half, we grew to 75 people. I learned how to raise investments and you know i learned how to be a ceo and today we're about a hundred people we're 63 percent women and that's not by design and and the median age in rappler is 23 years old it is the median age of the philippines that's kind of scary um and so when the oldies when we get when we get tired or cynical the energy of our young reporters we're really in the trenches infuse us with more energy and when our young reporters get lost we're old enough to be able to see where we're supposed to go right so it, it's been an amazing experience how do we uh, do it well originally at the beginning we were using an advertising model right we came across i i had the i had led the largest news group so i knew the advertisers but when we came under attack in 2016 uh, by 2018 we dropped 50% of our advertising revenue. And so we were forced to, in a two week time period, to create a product that took what we were doing, the methodology of how we were tracking disinformation networks, and turned it into a product that we can sell our clients. Not frontal facing for advertising, but really companies all around the world have to figure out how they're dealing with unstructured data or social media and using natural language processing we could also pull topic clusters out so we we created this and that model grew 12,000 percent from 2018 to the end of 2019 so now we have a very diversified revenue stream with advertising as about 23% and then this B2B model as 23% programmatic revenues. We've rolled out this new tech platform on World Press Freedom Day and hopefully by next week, hopefully I have an acquittal, um, but by next week it'll be rolled out site-wide and it'll be different because it will include not just a distribution of news, but a community and a whole new way of organizing the news. Hmm. And so um, how do you reach these uh, disparate communities that you are inspiring? Because they each have different needs. Um, I, I mean, obviously there are a lot of shared needs, but, but you perhaps want to target something specifically to a community on a small island, remote, whatever, uh, maybe a population of 10,000 or whatever. Um, so how do you target them without boring the people that don't live there? So I, I think in two ways, right? So the first is you, our membership grew because of our values. It's not actually just the content that they want. Yes, we will do investigative journalism, uh, but what they want is a shared community, like old style communities, like community organizing. Right? So that's part of how they come in. And in that, we have partner organizations. We're aligned. We have four main goals, right? For disaster risk reduction, a battle for truth, we're doing accountability journalism. And then each one of them, this is, this is the second part, they actually bring in what mm. they want, what they need, and we help give them, we loan our resources. A Zoom platform, for example, you know, we're doing these fact-checking uh, seminars, webinars, that then they then, it's like a Tupperware party. They come, they use, they use what we can do, we learn from each other, and then we do a story on what they have. Um, it's always evolving, and in the time of 
lockdown um, and no face-to-face -face, uh, interaction, it's also actually evolved far more quickly because you can we move faster. And strangely enough, all the attacks that Rapper has gone through in the last four years prepared us for this time period. And we hope our communities, um, will, so the third community that we're working with are young professionals who have businesses because mm -hmm. they don't know how they'll survive. And they, we, they meet like every week to try to figure this out. That's kind of cool. Um, impact, I think, is what we're trying to do. And it's, uh, I, it's a work in progress. And I think we keep trying to create it every day. Has anybody tried to mimic you? Has anybody tried to do what you're doing? Or is it it's still unique in the market, as it were? In the Philippines, it's unique because part of our strength comes from our small, we're very, we're only 100 people total. Uh, that includes our tech, that includes graphics, that includes uh, video, right? So that allows us to be able to move and to adapt quickly. Something that a large organization could take six months to roll out, we can do in a week. And that, that's very helpful. Um, globally, I think there are many groups that have tried and some have already closed. Mike, for example, Mike.com has evolved in a whole lot of different ways. Uh, you can argue that Huffington Post was that, but, but not really. Uh, we took, like when we were creating Rappler, we looked all around and tried to take the best, um, use technology, because our three, our Venn diagram is investigative journalism, technology, and community. And the BBC, for example, has a community arm, right, that is separate, a separate company. Mm. We have a separate unit. We call it our civic engagement team. Uh, but it's just a unit inside Rappler. I, I'm absolutely certain that technology will determine the future of journalism. And it, we should not leave it in the hands of technologists. We should own this and play with it and evolve it. Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, well, you, you probably have, have much the same experience as I do, but in, in, I've gone from, from news film, which you know took three days to, to get back from the front, yes. wherever it was, uh, the one inch. To, to, <laughs> yes, one inch to, took, uh, you know, half a day to get it to, to developed and the rest of it. And then editing it was so cumbersome. And now here we are. We can flick our fingers and more or less put it straight there. And what, as I listen to you and I look at you, I say to myself, is she safe? I, I think it is a dangerous time to be a journalist anywhere around the world. In our case, it's become far more dangerous for me. And, you know, I have a lot of repressed anger. I've had to learn anger management. When you get arrested for doing your job, you get angry. Uh, maybe it's like the frog in boiling water, you know, and, and maybe I don't know when to jump out. But I also know that this is a battle that matters. You know, we are in a battle for truth. And I think we're on the precipice for Philippine democracy. And um, I hate that the baton was passed to me at this point in time, but my ethics are not situational, you know? And uh, I was formed, the person I am was formed by the standards and ethics of journalism. So when it matters, I don't wanna buckle. And my team feels the same way. So is it safe? We think through worst case scenarios and prepare and drill our team for it. Um, but that's, it's kind of like drink, you know, like breathing polluted air. It's a consequence of where we are. And your the question there is, how are you going to let it affect you? What are you going, where do you draw the lines? And so far, um, I, I have no regrets. I think we're doing the right thing. We're on the right side of history. Uh, all I'm doing now in these court cases is demanding that if these political harassment cases earn me a conviction, I want people to sign this. And of course, the cost, I'm getting there. I'm trying to embrace my fear so that this way I, I rob it of its sting, right? Because that's the yeah. end goal. I, I, you, you one time journalist of the year. Now you have the One World Media Award and many other awards. Um, 
how important is international recognition? Is that part of your armor in a way? Absolutely. You know, I don't think, uh, you know, when, when Time Magazine awarded the, the Guardians of Truth, uh, they didn't tell me about it. I found out about it on Twitter. And when I saw the first tweet, I thought it was fake news. And I sent it to our, to our social media team. Um, but when I heard, when, when I got the call, and I realized that my, my first reaction was my stomach sank. Because it meant that I would become more of a lightning rod. I would become more of a target. And then I realized over time that that was a shield. It put a shield around us, around me and Rappler. And Rappler, oh, you know what I do in Rappler? My role is really to be the lightning rod so that I can take the attacks, so that my team can continue doing the work. And that's okay. Um, so thank you for recognizing our work because it helps keep us, keep us safe. Um, and I think the battles that are happening in the Philippines are now occurring in many, many other countries around the world. Our dystopian present is actually moving to, to the democracy near you. So it is for in your own, right? So I think that uh, we have to hold the line. What about the possibility of dialogue with the people who fear you? I mean, what would happen if you actually attempted to get an interview? I do. With, with Mr. Duterte. <laughs> yes. You know, uh, we, I interviewed him first in the late 80s when I was still CNN. And then oh, when you I had interviewed the cloak, him. You had the cloak of respectability. Yes. Uh, until, you know, up until we began to question the drug war. Uh, President Duterte, I was one of his first calls to congratulate him because I saw it in our data. And then uh, after he won as president, he uh, gave four interviews. One of them was to me. Um, this is in December of 2016. But you know, when I first met him again after that long period when he was deciding to run for president in October of 2015, when I interviewed him, he remembered. Uh, he, in fact, he was the one who said, you know, I remember that interview in mm -hmm. late. I, he, he remembered the interview. It wasn't a positive story. I don't know if he remembered that, but you know, um, positive or negative is in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> um, but that question, we, I, whether, I whether, whether, that question of whether dialogue is possible, it's beyond it. Um, it? I, I don't, I never say anything is beyond uh, because, you know, February 2018, President Duterte banned Rappler from coverage. We believe this is unconstitutional. And we challenged this at the Supreme Court, along with 40 other journalists and, and academics. It's still at the Supreme Court. Nothing has really happened to it. Um, I have nothing against President Duterte. But I do ask tough questions. Rappler demands answers and demands accountability. And so it, to us, it's not personal. But as you know, you know, when, when you have a budding, when you have a populist authoritarian style leader, they want to hear what they want to hear. And I think they've forgotten that, you know, journalists are here as checks and balances. And we must continue doing that because it makes them better and it makes us better. Well, Maria Ressa, thank you very, very much for talking to us and congratulations on your one World Media Award. And we're really grateful to you for talking to us. And stay safe, that's what we say these days. That's in the face of the pandemic, but for you, it's not just the pandemic, it's a lot more. I feel very privileged to have had this chance to talk with you. And you make me feel very small, and I'm six foot four. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you for your kind words. And thank you for the One World Media Award. Nice to meet you.